Okay, well, thanks for coming. So, uh, so the goal today is to sort of start a conversation amongst people from around campus and around the Bay Area um, about um, you know, how we think about scientific publishing going forward in the context of what science looks like now. Um, Uh, how do I get this to go forward, uh, Franklin? Uh, hey, Franklin, how do I get this to go forward? Um, so, you know, when uh, journals started 350 odd years ago, right, the, the, the main goal was to basically give the, you know, the gentleman scientists some place to kind of talk about all the stuff they were doing, you know, so the, when the Philosophical Transactions was founded, it was meant to give some account of the present undertaking studies and labors of the ingenious in many considerable parts of the world, where those considerable parts were like England and continental Europe, right? Um, but, you know, one of, the, one of the things that sort of developed as publishing came along was the idea that one of the goals of publication is to allow someone to reproduce what a scientist has done. So this is from the current nature uh, guidelines. The inherent principle of publication is that others should be able to replicate and build upon the author's published claims. And many people think that's one of the sort of sine qua non of, uh, of scientific publishing. Um, but you know, science has changed a lot, certainly since the 1660s and even in the last 50 years, right? Whereas 100, 100 years ago, you know, most of what scientists did was captured in a book like this, Marie Curie's notebook. And, you know, most of the data looked like things like this, like a, you know, a gel from doing Sanger sequencing, um, where, you know, the amount of data that one could generate on any one day was kind of human understandable. Um, move forward to today where you have, you know, ultra high throughput sequencing can generate terabytes of data in a day. Um, you have brain imaging generating, you know, terabytes of data about an individual. Um, and all of this stuff gets processed on supercomputers because, you know, it can't even fit on, on a laptop, much less, you know, be processed in kind of reasonable human time. So the question is, you know, how does, um, how do we understand publication in the, in the face of this onslaught? And so, you know, th this is a great book by our colleagues, uh, Brad Efren and Trevor Hasty, which pointed out that, you know, whereas, uh, you know, 50 years ago, even when I took statistics back in the 1980s, we did our exercises on one of these like statistical calculators, right? Um, many of you probably had the same experience. Um, now it's all done on computers, right? In part because there's just, we just couldn't do it. There's no way you're gonna analyze whole genome sequencing data on a little uh, hand calculator. Um, so what does this mean for publication in particular for the, the goal of publication to be able to replicate what other people have done? And I think that this, a uh, quote by our colleague David Donahoe from a while ago, I mean, David's really been a pioneer in thinking about reproducibility on the computational side. Um, I think this is a great quote. An article about a computational result is advertising, not scholarship. The actual scholarship is the full software environment code and data that produce the result. And so the question is, if we wanna think about if that's what it takes to publish something that somebody else can replicate, how do we do that in the context of you know um, most journals still being focused on like, you know, five to 20 pieces of dead tree. Um, so, you know, in the last decade or so, there's been a lot of movement around thinking about how to do this. Um, one is around sharing data, right? And so sharing data in some fields, like the field that I come from in human neuroimaging has actually been remarkably successful. I think this is a plot of just over the last decade from Mike Millen and colleagues, the number of publications that have arisen from five different data sets that they've shared openly. And this is just one example, you know, two, more than 200 papers coming out of these five shared data sets. Um, and we now have journals specifically focused on describing data sets. So the, the Journal of Scientific Data from Nature publishes what they call data descriptors. This is one that we published a couple of years ago that basically just describes an openly shared data set. Um, so I think that, you know, in some fields, uh, data sharing has become quite uh, palatable in others, not so much. Many of you may be familiar with this uh, editorial from the, uh, the editors of New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago, which laid out some concerns about the sharing of uh, clinical trials data and referred to um, 
concern amongst some frontline researchers, i.e. You know, I. people actually doing science, that the system will be taken over by what some researchers have characterized as research parasites. And of course, that led to this whole sort of Twitter explosion of you know, people creating badges for the research parasites and a research parasite Twitter handle. So clearly, you know, fields still differ. And even in neuroscience, we see you know, great differences across different areas of neuroscience in the degree to which people are willing to share data openly. Um, what about sharing code, right? So in, in a, given that almost all analyses that are done now are done with custom made uh, code, or at least you know, custom made scripts that sort of orchestrate code written by others. Um, and here, you know, it's interesting that GitHub is, has basically taken over the world, right? In terms of sharing code, like GitHub has become the place that people put their code, mostly just because they've made it easy to do this, right? We, those of us who've been sharing code for a decade or more remember having to deal with earlier tools that were just a real pain. GitHub makes it incredibly easy and you can see the, the growth in the number of repositories now up over 12 million. And even if you look at search for neuroscience or genomics, you see thousands of repositories with code you know, some of it very high quality, some of it not, but nonetheless code shared by people doing, you know, work in those areas. Um, what about environments? So one of the things that, that uh, David mentioned in that quote, right, is it's not just the code and the data, but it's the full environment. This, this part is hard. I mean, I think we'll hear some this afternoon from Lindsay Higgy about this. Um, but one thing we know is that even across operating systems, you know, the same software can give you different results. We've seen this in neuroimaging. And I'm sure that there's results in other areas that have shown the same thing. Um, and so, you know, we need to think about not just sharing code and data, but sharing a way to replicate an entire analysis platform. Um, so why does this all matter, right? Why should we care about this stuff? Well, I think one reason we should care is that, you know, there's been, for the last decade, there's been ongoing concern about sort of the ability to reproduce scientific results across all of science. You know, it started famously in psychology, but now we've seen it in many different areas. Um, and so there's, a, there's a, a broad concern of that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's done that just isn't reproducible. There's lots of reasons that might be, but part of it certainly is that, you know, the papers don't include all of the details that one needs to actually reproduce the finding. So we, when I moved here five years ago, we, um, we got a, um, a large grant from the Arnold Foundation, which has funded a number of efforts around kind of, uh, you know, scientific reproducibility. We started what we call the Center for Reproducible Neuroscience, which is basically meant to build um, infrastructure and tooling around um, helping people do more reproducible science, in particularly in the context of the kind of work that we do in uh, human brain imaging. Um, and so I just want to tell you for a moment, what are the kind of things that we do, just to sort of introduce us to you. So one of the things we do is work on repositories for open data. Um, in particular, we built one called Open Neuro that is now sharing, you know, many thousands of data sets from, from humans uh, doing various types of neuroimaging studies. We also share data at other levels. So we have kind of a, a whole ecosystem of data sharing for different types of different levels of data. Um, we work on open tools for reproducible data analysis. So for example, we have MRIQC, which is a quality control tool, fMRI prep, which is a robust pre-processing tool. We have other tools that we built all, all open source and all meant to be community efforts. Um, we work on open standards, so we've in particular been involved in something called a brain imaging data structure, which has become a pretty broadly accepted community standard now in the brain imaging field for basically how do you describe and organize a data set so that you can give it to somebody else and they can just use it. They don't have to ask you any questions. Um, and so that's, that's actually been very successful. And then we also do some work in um, meta science, sort of thinking about the science of science. And in particular, we've been interested in looking at how analytic results vary across people. I talked about some of this stuff a few weeks ago with the metrics group. Um, so I wanna mention the co-sponsors on this meeting. Um, so metrics, uh, John and Steve are both here, which is you know, sort of leading the charge on meta science on campus. Uh, the Data Science Institute, which is you know, sort of growing and really pushing uh, data science as a field and sort of really thinking about reproducibility as part of that. And then the Center for Population Health Sciences, which thinks a lot about uh, data sharing. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to Franklin, who is really responsible for making the meeting happen. He's our assistant director in the center. Um, and we, we should give him a hand for uh, <laughs> all of his uh, work on this. Um, and so here's our agenda for today. The goal was really to, 
Michael for doing this. Why, why do we put on this meeting? We put on this meeting because I wanted to get, you know, a number of people in the same room who I think think about the kind of issues that we've been thinking about, but from very different perspectives so that, um, you know, one, I, you know, we could all learn what each other are doing um, to hopefully kind of spur more collaboration and to kind of, you know, see if we can synergize the sort of ways that we're thinking about things. So we'll start out with Mike talking about this sort of reproducible science ecosystem, particularly in psychology. Um, Michelle is then going to talk about the ethics of both data and code sharing. Uh, Mike is going to talk about, uh, you know, how he sees the emerging landscape of publication. Um, we'll have lunch. Then Lindsay Hagee from Berkeley is going to talk about sharing code and platforms, particularly around the Jupiter ecosystem. And then Alex from Chan Zuckerberg is going to talk about the paper of the future. Then we'll have a discussion. Um, so if you have questions that come up, we'll have a, we'll try to have time after each talk for questions, but we'll also have time in the end for this sort of roundtable discussion. So, um, so I will uh, hand it over to Mike now.